Let's go to the next point. OK. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, don't program yourself to be victim because predators look for them. So uh, this was an interesting point that came up, and Ben knows more about it than I do. Uh, I have a, and mostly I speak in terms of anecdotes. So um, the one experience I have growing up is, uh, yes, I you know sometimes roughed some people up, whatever. But then I got roughed up also more than uh, I got into fights. So I always wondered, like, why, why do these people always target me? Uh, because uh, when you're growing up, uh, yeah, you may feel like a victim. But you know, at a certain point, after you reach a certain degree of self-development, you're like, it's my fault that they are targeting me. Out of all the people in the environment they can target, they are targeting me. So. Uh, it's totally my fault that I uh, create a situation where these people think that they can touch me and get away with it. You understand what I'm saying? Like, uh, uh, I have not created enough uh, uh, whatever it is that I need to create for these people to know. Like, like messing with Smith is like a bad idea. You do not mess with this guy. And some people are like that. You just know by default, hey, you do not screw with that guy. Uh, so. Uh, that again uh, tied into me uh, trying to develop uh, this dragon inside me so that you know these people cannot uh, uh, because it's the other point peterson made that uh, uh, you also need to have this uh, dark thing inside you because it's very useful at times because you will be dealing with people who are just horrible and uh, uh, that might be useful i uh, think this is a part which is not allowed in schools anymore like the type learning this isn't actually allowed in schools because when i was growing up in primary school uh there wasn't that much uh, teacher supervision in the playgrounds pretty much none uh so it very quickly became a situation of uh you are the person who gets beaten up or you're the person beating up other kids and then what happens is uh, you eventually become stronger because you don't want to get beaten up anymore and you learn how to fight or whatever and then you actually see your friends getting beaten up and then now because you've developed the monster inside you you can now protect your friends from other monsters and you learn how to harness that power so you learn not to be abused you learn how to become a monster and you actually learn how to harness that power for good but if soon as like something goes wrong in the, in the playground uh, then what you're taught is whenever something bad happens, you got to run to authority rather than improving yourself. And then the kids who did this, as soon as the teacher uh, went away, then they got pelted. Uh, and what it shares is, uh, you know, there's not always going to be an authority to protect you from the from the snakes, uh, and you need to become stronger. And and uh, this seems like it's happening uh, in. The United States uh, in the universities, so from what I've seen at least, where it's um, uh, people are, <laughs> or you have these issues where you have uh, these. There's one clip, and the, I can't remember what it was. Uh, the blonde in the belly of the beast, she posted this, where you had this uh, woman uh, yelling at this man who was saying things that she found offensive, and then as soon as she couldn't uh, yell to convince the man. Uh, she started crying and then ran to her boyfriend to argue. And then as soon as the boyfriend uh, couldn't win the argument against the man, then they both ran away uh, pretty much in tears. Um, but it was like the appeal to her authority figure to save her in this argument. Um, that was fairly interesting uh, rather than the idea of, uh, you know, becoming strong. And that's unfortunate as well because you don't win an argument by yelling at someone. You know, win an argument by just saying your truth and expecting the other person to believe it. You win an argument uh, by actually not attempting to win an argument where you actually have a discussion with the person where you acknowledge you could be both be wrong. <laughs> uh, and it's not a battle that you need to bring a sword to sometimes. Yeah, I think there's often a misunderstanding about what argumentation really is um, or what it should be rather, let's say. Most people use it as a, as an attempt to wield the the mighty sword that they have in their sheath, right? They they want to whip it out and show everybody how flashy and and uh, sharpened it is, right? But 
I mean, the result of that is the same as the result in war. You either kill the other person or they kill you with their own meager or shiny sword, depending, right? Um, no, it, it, what it should be, rather, is an attempt to bring the other person into your tribe of belief, right? That, like, that's ultimately what you're hoping if you have the right goal in mind, that you're going to convince the other person to join you in your belief, right? Or and, and to be convinced that your belief is wrong, because otherwise you want to get the hell out of it. Yeah, um, yeah, so right, like if you're if you're talking about uh, being open minded to the possibility that you are wrong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that's an important part of it. But you, you don't usually start an argument believing that you're wrong. Um, you can certainly so one of the more interesting ways that uh, I've seen um, belief structures organized is uh, something that Roger Penrose does a, a physicist who's quite famous. He worked on a lot of big problems. But he he categorizes theories into different into three different um, uh, types: uh, useful uh, theories, ridiculous theories, and you well, know, let's, let's just stick with those. So you, um, oh man, okay, I'm gonna stop myself there. <laughs> I've made my point. I'm gonna go down a crazy rabbit hole. Yeah. Well, as, as I, again, as this is a Peterson meetup, Peterson has a good quote on this, which is, you should aim to be less stupid. Uh, and I think that's really good because it's saying you could always be wrong and to be caught out on being stupid is, is actually a good thing. And, I, it, you know, it directly plays out where someone can be wrong and then they double down on the beliefs and then they do post justifications for why they're still correct. And that's horrible because they're not actually learning uh, they're not benefiting from the situation of being proved incorrect. Uh, and then maybe like that's still using more harsh terminology that is needed to be. But if you're operating in society and it turns out there's a better way of operating and you don't acknowledge that, then you're going to continue to be just as stupid. Um, and that doesn't benefit you. Now, you, you had talked a little bit earlier about how like, say you're being bullied, uh, a way to kind of uh, combat against that is to make yourself stronger. So, like, uh, it's, it's where it's very useful, to, I guess, to learn jiu-jitsu when you're in school or something like that. <laughs> uh, but there's also the other type of bullying that can occur or aggressive behavior of uh, preying on emotional weaknesses, I suppose. Uh, which, and, and that seems like it's a, something that's maybe being done more often just because in the school system, uh, physical bullying is being, uh, more uh, aggressively com uh, taken or uh, aggressively negated, uh, I suppose, by people. I I'm not exactly sure how true that is, but there's always that second type of, uh, insulting and behavior that's kind of the more social attack that, that occurs. No. So how, how can you combat that? Because it's not like you can go to a, a gym and work out your <laughs> uh, shame tolerance, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I think or maybe I you can. Do. Maybe oh, you can do that. Uh, and maybe that's what we're doing right now. This uh, type of uh, truth-seeking and reinforcing that we're doing now in conversation is is exactly that. It's the it's the attempt to emotionally and intellectually prepare yourself for the external world. So, I mean, we can talk about shameful things here. We can talk about uh, being bullied. We can talk about being a bully. We can talk about all these things that that exist in our lives and attempt to unravel them and make them better. I, I think that's the same thing as going to a gym and and lifting weights to destroy your muscles and make them bigger again, right? So the exact same process. You kind of break yourself down mentally. But to the point of... Um, so there is when you're playing the, the, the physical game with bullies, it's a game, right? Then they usually act that way too. Like it's a game to play. Um, you, can, you can win in a couple of different ways. You can go and train yourself to be stronger or better at the game they're playing, the physical one. You can become a jujitsu master. I, when I was a kid, I, 
I went the karate route, right? I got bullied, so I uh, learned some karate, right? Wasn't that effective, uh, but it taught me that principle. Uh, and so I worked on it some more. But the other thing you can do is you can change the game that you're playing, right? And I think this happens frequently in school situations where the smaller kid who is picked upon is usually the one who is excelling in some other game, uh, say the academic game, for instance. This is the uh, resentment that occurs in the dumber kids saying the smarter kids are uh, teacher's pets or uh, trying too hard or whatever, right? So it, you can succeed at that game, uh, or you can subtly alter the game that you're playing with the um, with the bully, right? You can you can humiliate them in some way that they wouldn't ordinarily have expected, right? And then in that way come out on top and, and show that you're not uh, an easy target, so to speak. Uh, the, yeah, so those are the uh, the three options, I think. You can get better at the game you're playing. You can totally change the game, uh, play a different game entirely or not play the game at all, which a lot of people do. Um, or you can, well, let's say the third one is to, to manipulate the game, to, to evolve it, to change it into something else. Hmm. This is uh, Karen Strong's going into this a bit in terms of schools and then the effects on on relationships and abuse. So it's actually interesting. So like domestic abuse between males and females is generally exactly uh, the same in percentages. Uh, however, the types of abuse does differ a little bit. So physical abuse, it does seem to be uh, a little bit the same, but then women also amplify their abuse because they're weaker uh, with weapons or tools and things like that. So they will use uh, scissors or knives and or throw things at the man instead of just pure muscle force. But then psychological abuse is way higher in women. I think it's like, I, I, I could I could get it high, but I know that's much higher, much higher in women, uh, the types of abuse. And that would make sense because if she can't abuse physically because the guy is stronger, then she will resort to emotional abuse uh, or psychological abuse instead. And you know, if this is playing out in the school grounds where now physical abuse is being prohibited, uh, then psychological abuse can happen. And, you know, that, that before, when I was growing up, there was a phrase like, stick and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And that was used to teach kids to start becoming, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's not um, stoic. Uh, I guess so where you become mindful where you can be psychologically abused but then withdraw yourself from the reaction of phase of that so the words don't actually penetrate you and hurt you and whereas if that's not actually taught the case where and words can really hurt people and that's like the insecurity bit because there's a part of insecurity or, or with psychological abuse that happens uh which is why mindfulness is a really part and important to this because someone like with physical pain, like I punch you, you actually fall to the ground because you're hurt. You now damage the other person's body. When with words is a powerful aspect of this where the vile, like the word will go into your brain, you interpret the word, you interpret the meaning, and then you hurt yourself. Uh, and this is the part where you can actually fix the way you're interpreting these words. And that's why some people get offended by a certain sentence and other people won't because that sentence is only going in certain people's brains and then they're using it to hurt themselves. Whereas um, other people, then they, they have the protections against those things. So then if you're in, uh, you can actually train yourself to be in, in an abusive relationship where someone can be psychologically abusing you and then you can still uh, be non-reactive to that. Uh, which is a very powerful uh, thing to to be, to do. Yeah, but yeah, it's, see, it's interesting you brought that up. Um, the uh, the phrase "sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me." These kind of neuroprotective colloquial expressions and and pop psychology phrases that w that we had that we used. Uh, yeah, I, I don't hear things like this anymore in, in education. It's it is all about the protection of feelings uh, yeah. and the protection. It, it's I, I wonder for that phrase whether it's been dumbed down and incorrectly dumbed down because I think the most accurate way of saying that phrase correctly or truthfully would be sticks and stones may break my or you may you may break my bones through sticks and stones but I will not hurt myself with your words full version of that statement mm, yeah that's good
Uh, and I, th I think the reason it's not used very much anymore is because there's the whole uh, idea of words are violence. And, and I, I agree with that because there's, it, it's, but I, I think it, it's, you're right in how it's, it's a violence we commit against ourselves through the instigation of certain words or phrases uh, spoken to us. So right. that, yeah, and I think stoicism is definitely an aspect of uh, trying to combat that. Like, I, I'm a pretty big fan of Tim Ferriss. It's it's you know, well, yeah, it's not the um, so like, like the phrase is not descriptive. Let's say it, it's not saying words will never hurt you. It's prescriptive. It's saying you should not allow words to hurt you. Right? Words should never hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a way to live and and be. Yeah, and, and by continuing on, like by trying to shut out words from being spoken, that disallows people from being able to uh, not protect themselves. Well, yeah, I, I suppose kind of protect themselves, or at least gird themselves to uh, be able to to withstand those words that are said to them, instead of turning into a a, a weeping child. Uh, as soon as these things happen, and, and of course, it's a it's a hard process to go through, and you're going to be, you'll you'll need to be that weeping child from words in order to grow from that, and and to learn how to make yourself stronger. I mean, we all start off somewhere, and we have to grow up and become better. I I'm going to take this into a very dark 180 degree turn. Uh, so, so one of the things is um, psychological abuse is also generally the abuse we do unto ourselves. We will tell ourselves we're stupid, we're insignificant, we're dumb, we shouldn't have done this, we're such an idiot for doing this, you're such a horrible person because you did these things, you can never amount to anything, your future is shit, la da 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 da. Like it's when the conscience, like there's the idea of like the demon on one side and the angel on the other side, and the angel is meant to be like the supportive one, and the demon is the one that wants to turn you into evil and then the way it can turn you into evil is by trying to kill the good in you so you hate yourself so much that you want to extend that hate now it's actually interesting because like for cutting uh or self-harm uh one of the reasons people do self-harm is to actually distract themselves from the emotional pain that they've inflicted upon themselves uh so someone could have a lot of emotional pain and they cut their wrist or cut the thighs or whatever it is as a way of taking the as a way of uh euthanizing the emotional pain because it's reactive now like your amygdala or your brain structures now recognize physical pain and then your your brain starts changing its way from the the frontal cortex self-harm uh into the physical harm that has been done to yourself but then the problem is is then that only works temporarily because uh, you end up hating yourself more for cutting yourself and then you end up cutting yourself more. Um, and people, uh, it's not just cutting, like there's other things like that. So there's like hair pulling or nail biting or, um, but cutting seems to be a very big one. There's also alcoholism, like these type of vices uh, seem to be ways of managing emotional pain. And it does seem, I, I do agree with John here, which is, uh, and, and I know that you weren't disagreeing with John, you were just elaborating on a, a different point there, Tyler, because uh, when John says it doesn't seem like there's a gym, it seems like you know, for a gym, it's like clear cut, get muscle mass, go, go to the gym, uh, become stronger by going to the gym. But emotional uh, coping mechanisms really don't seem like they're as clear cut, or maybe they were clear cut, but I think when we talked about this earlier in the call, like for men, like a lot of the ways men were able to emotionally cope, like going to the woods with the mates with guns and, and whatnot, or, or, you know, wrestling or sports, for instance, like even sports for children has, at least in Australia, and I, I'm not sure how much that extends outside, but uh, in Australia, you can't play Australian rules football anymore because people could get hurt. So instead they play soccer. And then even then, then the moms will be like, no, people can get hurt by sport. I'm not gonna allow any physical sport for them to do, do with that. And then yet physical sport, which can actually involve hurting for kids is a great way for them to actually recognize boundaries and 
it seems, uh, and maybe you were getting this, to this title a little bit, and I think Peterson may get to this a bit, which is that by improving yourself physically and making yourself stronger physically, you actually make yourself stronger emotionally. Like there's some type of system here because our thoughts are so much built off our biology. So if we improve our biology, we also improve our thoughts. And Richard Branson, he was once asked, um, what is the most important piece of advice you could give anyone? And he said, work out. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, especially for men, especially for us. It, it's extraordinarily important for our mental health that we have some kind of exercise. And honestly, uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the things I miss the most uh, since autoimmune diseases have kind of stripped me from the ability to do that, right? Like it, it is profoundly noticeable. Uh, there's a, and, and the cutting activity, right, is, um, it's a localization. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a point of contact where they take the pain and they, they take it from being abstract and nebulous and something they can't understand or get a hold on. And they make it into a physical cut that they can look at and see bleed and feel. And, and yeah, I, I, there's, my ex-wife was a cutter when she was younger, right? So I, I, um, I've looked into it quite a bit and there's, we used to, we used to be strong enough to handle bullies based on the cultural traditions taught to us where I grew up, let's say, I don't know if this is true around the world. I don't think it is right. But let's say some of the, like the phrase sticks and stones, right? That, that, that phrase is a bit of cultural wisdom the same that we pass down through religion or any other means. And it, it helped me understand. I, I did not interpret it incorrectly. I did not think words will never hurt me. I understood that they hurt me, that when bullies called me names or pushed me down, it hurt, right? Like those two things both hurt. But I understood that it meant I shouldn't allow it to hurt me. And, and that dramatically changed the way that I saw bullies. Um, we're not, school is a gymnasium for social interaction and how to deal with that it is it's just being hijacked by people who think that they can reorganize the world in their own image and it's not being done properly and it's screwing up a lot of lives and kids are not able to deal with bullies uh let's say in an effective manner i, w I wonder for this uh whether or not i mean like so there's two reasons why like say physical violence among children isn't punishable by, you know, it's not classified as assault and you'll go to jail for it, depending on how strong that physical violence is. But your normal physical violence as kids isn't something that is punishable by the law. And I wonder for this because there's an initial interpretation of this in terms of, well, they're not, uh, they don't have enough agency to realize what they're doing. So how can we punish them? There needs to be a time when they have agency so then we can punish them. So that's like an initial interpretation. But then I wonder about that to be, maybe it is not so much that, the, but then maybe, and I don't know if this is true, but then maybe it's also that those are the times when you can screw up in horrific ways to then develop the ability of during, dealing with the horrors of life. Uh, and so then that time by the adult, you know that bullying is generally a bad thing to do because you've been a bully or you've done bullying or you've experienced these hor horrors uh, from a life of reduced agency. So it seems like it's, yeah, it's a mechanism of putting kids in, in situations where horrible things can happen to them from the perils of reduced agency. So that way they can learn. So then when they're equipped with more agency, they can choose which side of agency do they wish to be on. And if you remove them, uh, where you treat uh, them as they don't have reduced agency, so they need to be controlled, then it prevents them from making those mistakes earlier when the harm is less to when they can make those mistakes as adults and do way more harm. Yeah, I think it's partly a byproduct of the, the structure that we have, particularly in the West, and it, it's, uh, it's getting, it's kind of diffused throughout all the world now. The, the educational model where uh, the, the children are essentially raised by the, the government institutions or the school institutions for most of their lives, most of their child 
childhood is spent in school being instructed by other people and the parents. So that the responsibility aspect, it used to be that parents were responsible for what their kids did. And legally, in some aspects, that's still true. So if your child is truant, let's say, for an extended period of time, the, the adults can be held responsible for their uh, lack of school attendance, right? But they are far more rarely held accountable for the type of antisocial behavior that you see in, in the bully interactions, right? That, that, that's, that's where it should be taken care of, that the parents should be responsible for raising a child that is uh, socially manageable, right? And if it's not occurring, you need to go to the parents. You, uh, you won't ever, listen, my, my mother was a teacher in the school system for decades. You'll never be able to change the child just at school. It, it, whatever, whatever moral or uh, social changes need to occur have to be reinforced at the home as well. And if you don't have parents at the home that care, partly because they've offloaded the responsibility to the government, then you end up with this situation where uh, the child is never fully held accountable uh, via the parents and they just keep getting away with the behavior again and again and again. It's, it's reinforcing for them po in a positive way because uh, they're doing what they want and getting away with it. Right? Yeah, we, we need to hold the parents more responsible, I think. We need, to, we need to teach parents that it is their responsibility to make their child lovable. I'm not an annoying little prick, you know? So, oh, John, do you have anything to add to this? We haven't heard from you. Yeah, I have something to add. Uh, mostly what was uh, I going to say has been said by you guys very eloquently. So, uh, <laughs> I'm happy about that. Um, so, I don't know about the eloquently part, but <laughs> from where I come, uh, um, I know how I would say it, but and how you people uh, say it, and I really liked how you uh, uh, dealt with it in three different uh, categories: play the game, not play at all, or become successful at a different game. That was really nice. Um, I, I was just going to speak on the cognitive aspects of it. Uh, and Ben covered that, that uh, when somebody says something to you, there is an interpretive engine in your brain. And uh, that engine will either lead to heart or uh, it will lead to positive emotion. So it's about that cognitive mechanism you have. Uh, for example, uh, it's uh, if uh, a friend of mine comes up to me and calls me the mother blipper word, you know, I'd probably start laughing. Uh, but if a stranger did it uh, in an aggressive way, I'll be like threatened because those two leads to totally different neural pathways, it seems. Uh, and uh, some people can have the most uh, like difficult, for example, when people walk up to me and says like something bad really happened, I just start laughing and I have to control myself. My default response seems to be, and I couldn't tell you why I find it funny. Like uh, sometimes at my own tragedy, I will start laughing. So, uh, and uh, my friends are not able to do that. And there was a time I couldn't do that. So it certainly, let me give you another uh, uh, example. So I used to run a lot. I was really passionate about it. And uh, I was preparing for a, um, uh, I think half marathon or something. and. Uh, I would run in the middle of the day and uh, when the lunch break was there and uh, one day HR saw me and she was like, uh, why would you be running in the middle of the day? And I said something like, uh, uh, the more you bleed in the training, the less you, the more you sweat in the training, the less you bleed in the battle, something like that. <laughs> so that helped. Uh, so that one thing helped me like go out there, that mindset in this excruciating summer and train and uh, when i would train i would go through all kinds of neighborhoods you know in the if you if you come to india you would find these big buildings and then you'll find find the middle class and then you'll find the really poor people and you can have that within five kilometers of your run all the experiences so some people would look at me in a weird way and start laughing and boy did that piss me off like crazy and uh, but what I was able to do is uh, 
use that to push even harder like uh, when they were laughing at me it was hurting me but i said you know what i that means i'll just be more successful uh, you know let them laugh uh, so what i'm saying is uh, there is a way for you to take that insult and modify your cognition in such a way that you are even able to grow even further because this is what i say to uh, not say in my own mind this is what i say to people who don't like me that if if you don't like me and want me to fail please say something nice to me and be nice to me uh, because if you start tearing me down and hurting me and attacking me emotionally that would just mean that i'll start fighting even harder like maybe not fight you directly but go home and go to the gym and push even harder on the weights or study even harder so you are actually making me more successful by attacking me and um, i would just feel bad for people who wanted to attack me because i'm like you shit heads like you are only making me stronger so uh, i cannot always do it but i have certainly uh, done it so it's a skill you can uh, learn hmm. so maybe instead of having these uh, safe spaces in colleges where you can like go through treatment and like have be able to kind of be comforted and such maybe we need the opposite and have these emotional abuse centers where random strangers can come up and insult each other and try to emotionally instigate each other to a point that <laughs> I think I th no, you're you're right, I right. I, th I think that's the role that can uh, comedians often play. In fact, um, the the laughter that Smith's talking about is found in the audience of people listening to a comedian proclaim all the ills of society in a funny way, right? And we we laugh about racist jokes and we laugh about uh, making fun of rich and poor and and all the weird social ills that we have. And and in that laughter, we're all kind of saying to each other as we all laugh together, wow, we all recognize that this is a problem and isn't life weird and awful, but ha ha ha, right? Maybe one day it will be better. Maybe I can walk out of this room and it won't be so funny next time or uh, maybe it's better than crying, who, who knows? But I think that's the role that, that uh, comedy and comedians or good comedy rather um, should play in society. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and yeah. I think uh, that's how a lot of comedians actually probably got their start was being bullied in, in school or not being the most successful uh, potential mate for people in, in school that drove them to try to hone their skill at making people laugh. And that was kind of their route to uh, <laughs> kind of playing the part of the, the fool of it. How can a bully uh, really get to you if you're affecting yourself way worse than they would have right yeah so and you know jim carrey actually has a, he has a very explicit reasoning for that and, and mentions it that that his start in comedy was essentially him attempting to make faces that even the devil could not uh, avoid laughing at right that, that was because he was being bullied and he wanted to be able to uh be hilarious so hilarious that the bully was laughing instead of beating him up that's exactly what got him into it. So yeah, I would say that that's it. You know, you, you experience pain in life and you have to deal with it. The comedian does it by, well, it does it through laughter, right? Through the laughter circuitry. Oh, and, 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 and like, even in uh, cases, uh, there's this one comedian, I can't remember his name, but he had a, a drunk, abusive father. And so in order to kind of uh, ma make it so that he didn't get the beatings, he would do this little impression of a monkey and that would make his drunk dad laugh quite a bit. And that was very useful for him in uh, staying well protected. There's a comedian Owen Benjamin uh, and he, he posts maybe like 10 YouTube clips a day. So and he's open about, but he has one series, <laughs> which is, uh, why did they laugh and he takes one of his comedy uh skits and then he explains bit by bit by pe why people are laughing and he does uh one where it's about he does a really famous comedy skit sketch called the gender wars and probably watch that before you watch his analysis on it but watching his an analysis of it afterwards there's a bit in there where he talks about the reason i could do this sexual joke 
is because I already established consent earlier in the joke by having the girl say that, like, think to herself that the guy is really hot. Uh, so one of the parts that is important about there is the reason why comedy uh, promotes laughter rather than uh, rage is that it provides a safe space and people who, yeah, it provides a safe space actually for people to engage in these things that are sensitive topics. Uh, where in the audience, it's a uh, it's a place where you know they everyone. If you've got those individual people, they all have different insecurities, and there's probably a conglomeration of certain insecurities. But then the environment, as well as how well the comedian can do it, is a comedian says it's okay. We're in this together. We can laugh at these absurdities because at the foundation they're absurd, and if we acknowledge them, then we can become stronger. But then, it, and it's a really tricky line for com comedians to to do, and it's it's very hard, which is why there's such a lack of good comedians, I think. Yeah, that's true. I I never I never utilized well. I never utilized the laughter circuit to make other people laugh when I was younger, uh, as an attempt to uh, use it as a defensive mechanism. But I did learn to laugh about my own suffering. Right, like Smith was talking about before, to, to laugh at yourself, to laugh at pain, right? Like there is a, it, it, it absolutely has a neuroprotective effect, it does. You, you, you transform almost anything by laughing at it, right? 